Hello. What the heck? Togon. We've recently seen in my last video that we can do a bunch of neat limits that are equivalent to the very, very famous Euler Mascheroni constant. And today I want to introduce a sort of analogous constant that has only to do with the sum of the reciprocal primes as opposed to the sum of the reciprocal integers or natural numbers in total. So it's going to it's going to look a lot like the first limit that we learned that sort of defines the Euler Mascheroni constant between the harmonic series and the natural logarithm as they you know the difference between them as n goes to infinity. And it has to do we have to go through the zeta function again. So we have to do like the logarithm of the product form of that and it's going to be quite interesting. We're going to discover a connection between Euler Mascheroni and this new constant and it's going to be pretty interesting. So let's take a look. Okay, so we remember from the video where I proved that there were infinitely many primes by using the sum over the reciprocal primes that we needed to know that the zeta function, the Riemann zeta function, zeta of z, can be written as a product over prime numbers. Namely, 1 minus p to the negative z all to the negative 1. And what we did was we took the natural logarithm of both sides, so the natural logarithm of zeta of z was equal to the sum over the primes of negative the natural logarithm of 1 minus p to the minus z, right? The natural logarithm, the logarithm brings the, the power down as a, as a product. Logarithm turns a product into a sum. So it's, you could imagine it actually sort of bringing everything down to the next level below it. Wow, I've never thought of it that way. <laughs> I've never actually thought of it that way. Like, it takes a product and turns it into a sum, and it takes an exponent and turns it into a product. I bet if you did it to tetration, it would turn it into an exponent. I'm not really sure. But that's a great way to think about it. Oh, that's a great way to generalize that rule. I gotta keep that in. I've never thought of it that way. That's... Wow. Well, you just witnessed me having a light bulb moment. Point is, we can do the exchange of, for the infinite sum representation of ln, negative ln of 1 minus something, the Taylor series of that. We can write it as the sum over the primes of the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of... Um, <clears throat> p to the negative z k over k. But now we can sort of flip the, because this will converge absolutely for z with real part greater than 1, we can flip these and we get that this is equal to the sum from k equals 1 to infinity uh, over the sum of the primes of, and I'm going to bring the 1 over k to the outside, and it's 1 over p to the z k, right? Now, we can actually write this as this is the prime zeta function of z k, right? Because the, what is the prime zeta function? The prime zeta function is just like the original Riemann zeta function in its original definition, the sum from k equals 1 to infinity of 1 over k to the z, right? Reciprocal powers of the integers. Whereas the prime zeta function is just that, but only over the prime integers. So from 2, 3, 5, 7, etc., etc. And that's usually denoted capital P of whatever the input is. So we can theoretically write, rewrite this as this whole thing right here is P of zk, right? Because it's, it's the sum over the reciprocal powers of primes, and that power is zk. So this comes out to the sum k equals 1 to infinity of capital P of zk over k. And that's all well and good. But the point is, as z goes to 1, right, we're going to end up with p of 1 in the numerator over 1. And for the first term, k equals 1, right? And p of 1 diverges because p of 1 is the sum of the reciprocals of the primes, which diverges. That was what, it, what we proved in the second nuclear proof of infinitely many primes. And so... Right, we can't just let z go to 1 here because then that would be a bit of a problem. But what we were able to prove is that we, if we broke this up into two pieces, one where the first term is set aside, so just uh, k, the k equals 1 term, which is just p of z, right? The prime zeta function as it stands, right? Plus the rest of them, so the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of p of z k over k. Before you would have seen this as the second sum here, right? Always always as two sums in the previous video, but I'm simply rewriting this part, the sum over 
the primes p of p to the zk as the prime zeta function, and that's simply then being multiplied by this 1 over k here. So it's all within this sum, right? I hope that makes sense. We know that this sum of things is equal to the, the natural logarithm of the Riemann zeta function. And we're actually going to use this relationship to get directly at the prime zeta function in another video using something called Mobius transformation. And I'm going to prove that that's actually a valid way of doing something because I, it's very difficult to find any proofs of it, and I've simply had to find it myself. And, you know, I mean like online, but I'm sure it's, it's in plenty of texts. And I have, a, I have a, a number theory textbook that I, that I sometimes skim through just to find facts. But, uh, and we'll, we'll do that next time. That right now, I just want to explore a particular constant. Now, because we know that this portion of that was always finite, right? That was part of the proof to show that this diverges as z goes to 1. This is always bounded, right? So what we can do, actually, because we know that this is going to diverge, and therefore this whole thing is going to diverge, as well as this diverging as z goes to 1, we can take the difference of these two things, and therefore as z goes to 1, whatever this ends up being has to be the limit of that difference. Right? Much like how the euler moscheroni constant is the limiting difference of the natural logarithm and the harmonic numbers. So we're going to subtract that over, and so we're going to get ln of zeta of z minus the prime zeta function, which remember is just the sum over the reciprocals of the primes, the, the single powers of primes. This is equal to the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of the prime zeta function of zk divided by k. Now what I want to do is actually flip this difference and make this negative, right? So what I want to do is I want to flip this difference and I want to make it negative. So we're just going to flip the difference. This is going to become the negative of what it was. And we're going to have prime zeta function minus the natural logarithm of the regular zeta function equals this negative quantities because I simply flipped the difference. And now what we're going to do is we're going to take the limit as z approaches 1 of both sides. but we know that this is always bounded. So this is going to be a fixed value, a fixed constant by the end of this, this limit, whereas these both diverge. But essentially what we're saying is that we have another limiting difference going on here. right? The difference between the prime zeta function and the natural logarithm of the zeta function approaches this constant. So because it will be perfectly well defined, and we're starting at k equals 2, so we're not going to get p of 1 in here, we can just plug in 1 for z. So we get negative the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of the prime zeta function of k divided by k. So take every single integer input of the prime zeta function, divide it by that integer, add them all up, and make it negative. And that's the limiting difference between the prime zeta function and the natural logarithm of the Riemann zeta function. And if you plug this into Wolfram alpha, you will get about negative 0.315. Now remember that. I'm not, I may not be able to prove this relationship. We'll see. And I might have to edit out this statement I'm making now. Hopefully, trusty cup of Joe will lead the way. But this is not the constant that we're after right now. This is almost the constant that we're after, because I want to take a look at something. Well, what, what I, want to, I want to sort of look at this limiting difference again and sort of consider it in a different light. So this is a pretty cool constant. It's the sum over all of the valid positive integer inputs to the prime zeta function divided by all of the integers that you're inputting. And you get this neat little constant, negative 0 0.315. And it's, it's irrational, of course. I mean, sorry, I don't, know, I don't actually know that it's irrational. I'll, I'll hold my tongue there. It's, it's, it looks very irrational. And I would be very surprised if it wasn't. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this limiting difference again. So we know it at least goes to a constant. And I want you to keep this constant in mind, about negative 0.315, because that's relevant. We were considering the limit as z goes to 1 of the sum over the prime reciprocals minus the natural logarithm of the Riemann zeta function, right? And sorry, there should be a z there. And we know that this is going to be about negative 0 0.315, right? We, that's what we just showed, that this is, that it's equal to that sum over the prime zeta functions at positive integers other than 1 divided by those positive integers. And that approaches this constant here. What else can we do to this? So what we can do is instead of immediately assuming that we're summing over all the infinite terms here and all the infinite terms in the Riemann zeta function, let's, let's limit that. Let's, let's say we only add up to the nth terms in both of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to say that this is equal to the limit as n approaches infinity of this stuff in here, the limit as z approaches 1 of the sum over the primes less than or equal to n, so not all the primes, just less than n, of 1 over p to the z, minus the natural logarithm. And now I'm going to replace the zeta function with its definition, the sum definition, but only to the nth term. 
not to infinity like, it, like it's normally defined. So it's the sum from k equals 1 to n of 1 over k to the z. So we've got this big triple limit. And this is still equal to this, right? Because as, when, as soon as n goes to infinity, you get the original statement. As soon as z goes to 1 and n goes to infinity, it all works out. So simply what we're going to do is now that this is a finite sum, right? Both of these are finite sums. They only go to n. There's nothing wrong with plugging in 1 for z, right? There's nothing wrong with that at all because both of them are finite sums, so they will converge if I plug in 1 for z. So I'm sort of replacing what's going to cause the limiting difference to occur. So I'm going to let z be 1 now, and I'm simply going to have n go to infinity, thus giving us the same result in the end. So this is going to be equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of, now I'm just plugging in 1 for z. So I get the sum of the primes less than or equal to n of 1 over p minus the natural logarithm of the sum from k equals 1 to n of 1 over k. And I hope, I hope it's clear what, how these are the same thing, right? But instead of having the power go to 1, I'm simply cutting the sums off at finite parts and then placing in 1 as the power and then now letting the, the upper bound of the sum go to infinity. But it's the same thing. But what you'll notice here is that this is the nth harmonic number. As z approaches 1, zeta of z looks more and more like the harmonic function, the harmonic series, right? And so if we bound the upper, if we, if we keep the upper bound finite, then we do just get the nth harmonic number. But we know that from the previous video, that here's a little thing. So we know that from the previous video, the limit as n approaches infinity of the harmonic numbers minus the natural logarithm function approaches, by definition, gamma, this finite constant, right? 0 0.577, which means that these two things grow asymptotically the same, right? Because the difference between them approaches a finite value and their quotient will approach 1 as n goes to infinity, these two things are asymptotically identical which is to say that because this is the nth harmonic number, this thing will grow like natural logarithm of n, right? Just like it does here, that's sort of, this has been proven multiple times that this difference, that this limiting difference exists and it's this number. It could have been any constant number, right? But because it is a fixed real value, a constant value, these things grow the same in an asymptotic nature. Their quotient approaches one and their difference approaches a fixed real number. So I can replace this with the natural logarithm of n and know that because it grows the same, that this difference will also have a limit. I'm replacing it with, with natural logarithm of n. These things are not equal, but I'm replacing it with that. And I know that this limiting difference will still have a fixed value because this grows the same as the natural logarithm of n. That's how like asymptotics and big O notation kind of works. You can replace them with one another as long as they're asymptotically the same, as far as I know. So what, that's exactly what I'm going to do. So this next step is not going to be equal. It's not going to be equal. I'm just transitioning now. So I'm saying since h sub n is asymptotically equal to the natural logarithm of n, I'm going to replace this with ln of n. And you'll see we have this neat little limit as n approaches infinity of the sum over the primes less than or equal to n of the reciprocal primes minus the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of n. And this difference has a limit. But notice, this is very, very similar to the limiting difference that defines the Euler-Mascheroni constant. Instead of the sum over all the integer reciprocals minus the natural logarithm, it's the sum over all the prime reciprocals minus the natural logarithm of the natural logarithm of n. Which is to say that the harmonic series, which grows logarithmically, already grows incredibly slowly because logarithms grow incredibly slowly. But this, the sum over the reciprocal primes, grows like the logarithm of the logarithm. So that's double log. Like, that's so slow, it's just f***ing ridiculous. So this still diverges because this still diverges, right? This n goes to infinity as it goes to infinity, which means the natural logarithm of n goes to infinity, which means the log of the log of n goes to infinity. Very, very, very slowly. But we proved that the reciprocals of the primes diverge, which means they must diverge so exceptionally slowly, I, I couldn't even, I can't even put it into words, right? It takes, it takes an exceptionally large amount of terms to get anywhere right? Yet it will eventually get as large as you want it, no matter how many, no matter how large of a number you say, I can pick an n such that the sum over the reciprocals of that many primes exceeds that value because it does diverge. And this limiting difference is defined 
usually capital M, and is about 0 0.269, I believe. Sorry, 0 0.261. And this is called micelle mertens constant. It is the limiting difference between the prime zeta function and the log of the log of n. So the prime zeta function grows even slower than the harmonic series, which is, makes sense because it's like, not half the terms, but considerably less terms, less terms. But, but what does this have to do with the constant that I showed before? Right? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rewrite this up here, and we're just going to erase what we did so far. I hope that was clear. All I did was replacements of things that were asymptotically equal. That means that it must still converge to a specific value, and we're going to consider this now. The micelle mertens constant. So I'm just going to move all this up here. So what do we have? We have that the limiting difference as n goes to infinity of the sum over the primes less than or equal to n of 1 over p minus the natural logarithm of the nth harmonic number is equal to that fancy sum we had before, which was the sum over the prime zeta function of k over k, right? k to infinity. And we also showed that if we replaced the, har the nth harmonic number, which this should be an n, sorry, if we replace the nth harmonic number with the natural logarithm function, we got a different constant. n goes to infinity of the sum over the primes less than or equal to n of the reciprocals of those primes minus log of log of n. We got a different constant. 0 0.261 dot dot dot. And so as it turns out, because this limiting difference exists, it's about 0 0.261, and it's defined to be capital M, the micelle mertens constant. It actually turns out that since I, I asked you to remember this constant here, this number is euler mascheroni plus this negative amount. So the about 0 0.577 minus about 0 0.315 gives about 0 0.261, and so it's literally that exact thing. So we can actually say with certainty and perhaps I'll attach a proof after this once I've figured out how you can actually prove that, because at the, at the instant that I'm filming this right now, I don't actually know how to prove it. This is equal to gamma minus the sum from k equals 2 to infinity of the prime zeta function of k divided by k. The limiting difference between the nth harmonic number and the natural logarithm of n minus the limiting difference between the nth prime harmonic and the natural logarithm of the nth harmonic number is equal to the limiting difference between the nth prime harmonic and the log of the log of n, which is just astounding. So this is another way of considering the Meisel mertens constant, and that's what it's equal to. It's equal to this limiting difference between these two functions, which is to say that the nth prime harmonic grows like the log of the log of n, which is exceptionally slow, but still diverges. So that's what I wanted to share. Let's see if I can attach a thing at the end of this that actually shows what I'm talking about. Quick little thing, this channel has an Instagram, so it is at what the hectagon, of course, and it has a Twitter also. So this is Instagram, and of course this is Twitter, and it is of course naturally, of course naturally, naturally, of course, also what the hectagon, at what the hectagon. Nope, at the hectogon. Oh, can't spell today. Okay. Hectogon. And my email is the incorrectly spelled what the hect agon. Why spell check before you make the email, right? That you can't then change at gmail.com. Now, all of these are in the description if you don't want to have to somehow watch the video and pause it and actually write it down. Um, along with other Instagram, Twitter, YouTube accounts that me and my friend Bill run. Uh, he does one for DND. We together stream on Mixer under the moniker of Fred Wood Live. So check the description for other stuff. This is just for my channel. This is my Instagram at what the hectogon, Twitter at what the hectogon, and email at what the hect agon, because I spelled it wrong when I made the email and now I can't change it. So that's the uh, that's the stuff. Thank you for watching and uh, bye bye.